Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Caleb. The final speaker in our session before we go on to questions and discussions will be Dr. Elizabeth Heitman from the University of Texas Southwestern Medical School, who will be speaking on the ethical and welfare considerations regarding precision animal modeling. So Dr. Heitman. And my screen is not up here. Is it supposed to be? I've touched. There we go. Lots of things up now. There we go. Thank you. Good morning. I am very pleased to be talking about ethical issues in the first session of the workshop, which, as Dr. Hooks Barnard noted, is often left until the end and sometimes tacked on with, uh, with less than firm adhesive to make sure that um, we talk about it but doesn't necessarily stick. I'm hopeful that we're all going to be able in this workshop to think not only about ethical issues but the practicalities of addressing them more concretely. This is one of the very important elements of what the Academy's panels and studies often do, which is to think about anticipatory governance. And anticipatory governance, like precision medicine, is a, a term that has an awful lot of definitions, but we can think about it largely as strategic and policy-oriented planning for risk management and risk assessment and risk reduction, thinking about how to manage new technologies and new aspects of science as they emerge, but with that caveat that we heard again from Dr. Hooks Barnard that we tend to overestimate in the short term and tend to underestimate the effects in the longer term. Timing in this regard is crucial, and this is one of the very first sessions that has been held in a scientific and policy environment talking about animals and precision medicine. One of the problems is that if you engage too early in the cycle of the technology and the development of the science, there's not enough known about what's going on and what's going to happen to be able to predict the manifestations of the science and technology, how it might be applied, and what its possible effects might be. But if you don't get there in time, the horse is out of the barn and more mature technologies may be too far diffused to be able to manage with policy or with even professional norms and standards because people have already adopted their own practices. I don't know that we know where we are today in terms of the possibility of anticipatory governance with precision medicine in animals. I think that this workshop is going to give us a lot of insight into what we need to be thinking about, and we may discover, as is often the case, uh, a lot of erratic uh, standings depending on the aspect of the technology itself. What I can tell you is that ethics and values is essential, but entirely dependent on knowledge of the science. Professional standards of ethics and professional standards of practice shape the way that new scientific developments unfold, what work is done in the first place, and then it, that informs how they're applied. So the scientists start the ethics. And then the public's diverse values support, or as folks in animal uh, laboratory research know too well, oppose scientific developments and the development of new technologies, often, again, from very distinctly different perspectives from what the scientists are thinking. We know that precision medicine is very attuned to the need for public engagement and public discussion of values related to the science, but it's not really been addressing questions of animal research. Ethicists, like most other participants in anticipatory governance, need to be able to predict how a technology will be used but ethicists have the same sort of murky crystal ball as many other people in the public, and unfortunately we see a lot more dark clouds in our crystal ball worrying about the things that can go wrong. Because typically ethical standards are applied and ethical questions are asked retrospectively, after something has gone wrong, after a new technology has been developed that dramatically changes the status quo and we don't necessarily get ahead of the, the situation well. And as I said a moment ago about the public, ethicists must rely on others' reports of the new science and must be able to understand the science even as the science is unf unfolding. And what I've found in preparing for this discussion 
is that animal models in precision medicine is still such a new topic that there's no ethical discourse. There has been very limited discussion of animals in precision medicine in ethics and almost nothing looking to the future. Now, as we heard from our, our moderator and chair, Dr. Lloyd, the first outline of where precision medicine will need to include research with animal models was published only last year, last August. And the areas in which research with animals will be needed for precision medicine were first outlined there. Comprehensive exploration of all of these fields, in fact, is going to come from this meeting. It has not been taken uh, undertaken by anyone else at the moment. So what do we do when we don't have a factual basis to think about ethics? We go back to the basics, and I'm really pleased to see that of three printed definitions of precision medicine, we've all gone to the same source. Uh, mine is a pastiche of different pieces of what's on that slide on the National uh, Library of Medicine's website. But precision medicine is data-driven treatment and prevention that, to go back to the slide that everyone else had, takes into account individual variability in genes, environment, and lifestyle for each person. I think it's extremely important that we all picked the same definition. And I say that because disparate definitions can lead people into very different understandings of what the ethics may be. When we begin to think then about this definition and how it shapes animal modeling, we have the key questions of data-driven genes, environment, and lifestyle. And so consideration of ethics and welfare in animal research in support of precision medicine will need to include attention and perhaps frameworks that shape the ethical questions around the reliability, sharing, and use of animal data, how we model genetic effects, how we model environmental effects and their interaction with genetics, and how we model lifestyle so social and behavioral effects, both with genetic and environmental effects as well. It's also very true that the, the world of animal research has a very strong framework, and returning to the basis of the three R's gives us a very strong platform from which to think about ethical issues and research in general. When we think about the need to have replacement and reduction and refinement of animal research as ethical goals, we can identify a number of ways in precision medicine that we need to think about ethical questions and the work to be done. Researchers should use animals of the lowest level of evolutionary complexity, something that will be increasingly possible with genetic modification and design of animal models. And we should replace animal models with alternatives wherever possible. Again, the replacement with data instead of with animals is something to be looked forward to. Protocols should be based on a thorough knowledge of past work and designed to reduce the number of animals and experiments to the fewest necessary to answer the research question in a statistically significant way. Again, something that large data sets should help with enormously. And then researchers should continuously refine their procedures to eliminate or at least minimize animal pain and distress. Again, something which genetic precision should help with tremendously. There are ethical concerns, however, regarding the data-driven work. And these are ones that we've heard about in the last two presentations in a practical way thinking about humans. But how many collaborative databases are we going to have? Databases that support and uh, support reduction and replacement of animals already exist, and there are a number of them that I've listed here. You'll notice that some of them are international databases. How do we think about planning for international data sharing? Ethical norms and best practices in da data sharing generally are being established now for human medicine and basic science that has nothing to do with genetics, but we're struggling on these points. I don't know about your institutions, but individual interpretation of even NIH's comprehensive policies lead people to different practices. And thinking about what it means to share data when sharing data also requires funding from external sources is a human challenge that will affect medical research with animals as well. 
We also need someone, someone's plural, who will coordinate systems, ensuring that the system that I developed in my corner of the universe can talk with not only other animal systems, but the human computer systems that are going to be used for patient-based data and research. When we think about supporting communication among scientists, we heard earlier about the problem of multiple databases, multiple websites for particular genetic information, where to take care of a patient, you may need to send multiple emails with multiple copies of HIPAA forms in order to get information from the researchers who have a data set, but no way yet to share it. When we think about environment and environment gene interaction, we're going to have some difficulty, increasing difficulty, I think, with housing standards for animals and welfare standards, especially for animal models of illness linked to complex environmental exposures, multiple pollutants, multiple problems with sick buildings and noise. When we think about animal studies on environment gene interactions, they often look for clinical answers or physiological information, but on problems that public health may already have an answer for. We know that pollution is bad. How bad do we need it to be? Do we want to think about the justice questions, both for humans and, uh, <clears throat> and animals, of testing to determine what safe enough pollution might be? or whether we could develop a drug that would offset the risks of environmental hazards so that someone medicalizes what would otherwise be concerned, considered an environmental problem. Similarly, studying the effects of gene lifestyle interactions will need to distinguish very carefully between behavior, which in public health is often considered volitional, something we choose at some level to do and where humans can be led to change. An environment which is typically thought to be beyond our control as individuals. So for example, if we're going to talk about smoking, as Dr. Califf brought up the issue of tobacco control as a, a major issue in public health and smoking a major consideration in precision medicine. How might a model for volitional cigarette smoking, as opposed to toxic exposures, differ for one, from one for chronic exposure to wood smoke for a human? How would we develop animal models with these questions in mind? Interactions between genes and volitional behaviors are going to require animal models that can express volition. And that may be an animal model that is more sentient than ones who simply need to be passive participants in an environmental hazard. Something that many people are talking about with precision medicine in humans is the identification of refined and early endpoints, knowing when we have a problem and knowing how to intervene. Seeking refined early endpoints in animal studies creates attention for what happens in human medicine, because very often, we're going to be looking for longitudinal data for humans with prolonged, chronic, and even sometimes terminal illness. How to think about exposing animals under current welfare and housing standards to the elements that we typically identify as poverty-related determinants of health. We'll need to expose animal models for the long term to harmful environmental factors and stressful social settings that may violate standards for housing and welfare and enrichment. And similarly, something that has been an interest of mine for about eight years since a, an earlier project on animal models for biodefense, many of today's successes in precision medicine, such as treatment of advanced cancer, tend to identify interventions that prolong the very last parts of life, come at a time when with an animal model, we might already be seeking euthanasia for an inhumane burden of, of cancer or other suffering. How we think about long-term animal models for dying is something that precision medicine may need to grapple with. This is not something that is left exclusively to ethicists. Researchers, research institutions, funders, people in this audience, need to look for and recognize both old issues but new and potentially unexpected <coughs> ethical issues as the science of precision medicine 
and animal modeling progresses. And, and this means particularly people who are up close and personal on the front lines, who are able to see what is ex being experienced by the animal, but also by IACOOKs and IRBs and reviewers of method sections of papers and grant submissions. And then the patients and families who are increasingly being engaged in the Precision Medicine Initiative to undertake discussion of what their values are in relation to the, to the project. Precision Medicine's ethical commitment to public engagement really needs to include animals. How we're going to do that is something that my colleague Rich Sharp, I think, will be speaking about tomorrow. But it is a challenge because at the moment we don't do animal discussion with the public very well. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Heitman.